of course, I would have preferred to be here in person, but maybe we're all heading in a better direction now. Um, and um, at least some of us in the world are heading in the direction in the world, the good direction. There's a lot of people who are still in really challenging situations. So, yeah, um, I'm going to be telling you about uh, work that um, I've been doing in the field of ancient DNA, and I'm going to be using a kind of personal lens slightly in order to try to bring you into some up to date and some of the the progress that's happened in this field. Um, and so while I'm going to be heavily emphasizing and really talking about my own trajectory and my own work, um, I uh, also trying to use this talk as a way to help you to understand the broader field, which is much bigger than my own work. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna outline of my talk is I'm going to be trying to provide a little bit of a personal perspective on the ancient DNA revolution, which is still so recent. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, how ancient DNA has provided some really meaningful solutions to the puzzle of Indo-European origins, and I'll explain that. I'll talk about some surprises in terms of learning about population history in the Southwest Pacific. And I'm gonna talk about a new frontier I'm particularly excited about, which is learning about population size and demographic history from this type of data. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my trajectory, and actually this is when I met Christian Schlutter for the first time at a conference about microsatellites that was organized at Oxford, uh, which I helped sort of as a graduate student um, to uh, help, help helped organize that a little bit, um, organized my, by, by my PhD supervisor, David Goldstein. So I began my PhD in 1997, um, and the idea of the work for my PhD, a simple way to explain what I was working on, was that uh, I was trying to see how using multi-locus methods could be helpful for learning about human population history. So a lot of the most interesting work on human population history had been done by single locus systems like mitochondrial DNA um, or by uh, simple uh, principal component analysis uh, of uh, allele frequencies uh, of, of, of multi-locus systems, but I was really focusing on trying to uh, carefully think about what you could learn using multiple parts of the genome simultaneously by learning about human history. And the person who really pioneered this direction of the work was Luca Cavalli-Sforza, who made a big bet in 1960 that it would be possible to reconstruct the past from modern genetic data. Here's a book that he published in 1995 describing the results of a decades long research program where he and his colleagues uh, assembled data from blood group polymorphisms, uh, a, a protein variants that can be um, uh, genotyped uh, through uh, uh, protein assays uh, like the ABO blood group and whose frequencies can be measured in different populations in the world. By looking at about 100 of these, they saw gradients of frequency and in principle component analysis uh, would um, appreciate uh, patterns. Um, but at the time, uh, in 1997, we uh, had tens of thousands of times less data than we do now because of the um, uh, huge leap forward in DNA technology, which has made sequencing a million fold cheaper than it was before, uh, and we didn't have ancient DNA. So then I started my postdoc. I decided at the time that while I was interested in human, using human population history, um, and studying population history, really the methods we had were limited at the time. And I was interested in using population history to learn what's needed to map disease genes. Um, and so I did a postdoc uh, at the Whitehead Institute Center for Genome Research, uh, supervised by Eric Lander, who's now on the cabinet of the United States as of a few days ago as the science advisor. Um, and um, uh, although uh, that means I probably won't be able to talk with him anymore, but um, we did a study where we were trying to understand the determinants of how far allelic correlation uh, extends in the human genome. And of course, population history is highly relevant to that. Um, and what was predicted prior to our work was that the extent of allelic correlation in humans would be just a few kilobases uh, in that one would have to lay down an extremely dense map of polymorphic genetic markers to carry out an association to so study to find disease risk factors for disease based on what we knew about the human effective population size. So we empirically measured this and found that the extent of allelic correlation was about an order of magnitude larger than expected. Um, and we now know the reason for that. Part of it's demography and most of it is recombination rate and homogeneity in the genome. 
Um, and we study this in a variety of different ways, also based on the pattern of allelic correlation in the genome, which I did and not just with David, with, with Eric Lander, but with David Altshuler. Um, so when I started as faculty in 2003, um, it was an exciting time because it was just becoming possible to realize the promise of uh, of carrying out whole genome association studies where you look at frequency differences and variance between people with and without a, a phenotype like a disease. Um, although it was still extremely expensive. And so Nick Patterson, a statistician who I met for the first time in 2001 and who's been my main scientific partner since that time, um, Nick Patterson and I uh, decided to focus on a particular uh, set of human populations where allelic correlations, linkage just equilibrium extends much further than it does uh, in most populations in the world because of the recency of the demographic event events that formed the allelic correlations, specifically admixed populations in the Americas, African Americans and Latinos, whose populations formed through mixture in the last, on average, maybe five or six generations. Because of that, there's large contiguous segments of African, European, and Native American ancestry in these populations. And by painting the genome according to where these segments are and associating ancestry to disease risk, you could lay down a map of or order of a thousand markers and, and practically carry out an association study using the technology of uh, 2000 and early 2000s. So this was the type of work that I focused on. We developed methods for uh, carrying out these studies, um, computational and theoretical methods. We developed a mark of chain Monte Carlo that accounted for all the uncertainties we were worried about biasing these statistics. And in my laboratory, I've always had a twinned laboratory where we not only develop methodology, but also uh, uh, prove that the methodology works in our laboratory and develop the reagents. So we developed a map of genetic markers that were highly differentiated between people of African and European ancestry. And we did this also for Latinos too, for markers different between people of Native American ancestry. And then we tried to focus on proving that this worked in practice, not just putting the tools out there, but by really working with uh, patient cohorts and epidemiologists to try to identify risk factors for disease and to show these methods could work in practice. And so this was one of the very first association studies that was successful. Uh, we published this study in 2006 um, that found a risk factor on chromosome eight for prostate cancer in African-American men. African-American men get prostate cancer about 50 to 100% more often, 1.5 to two times more than do uh, other men in the United States. And it's always been a mystery why uh, many environmental covariance and dietary risk factors and other, other issues uh, had never been found to be explaining this. And so one hypothesis that was interesting to investigate was whether there are genetic variants that predisposed to, predispose to prostate cancer that occur more commonly in people of West African descent and that have come through the history of slavery into the United States uh, into the African-American population. And so um, our day jobs, uh, Nick Patterson and mine in this time, was trying to find risk factors for diseases, genes uh, for, for, for diseases that are differentially risky across populations like prostate cancer. And the way this method works, admixture mapping is, as I mentioned to you before, uh, we look at where in the genome people have African and European ancestry. So here is a representation in cartoon form of 10 individuals. They're one copy of their chromosome eight. And the red segments might be segments of European ancestry. The yellow segments might be segments of African ancestry. People have segments of African and European ancestry in different places. If prostate cancer risk is conferred by variants that live on an African, uh, West African genetic background, you expect the people who will get the disease will tend to people be to tend to be people who at the risk loci have entirely or more than average proportion of African ancestry. You see two yellow copies here. And if you add this up over, in our case, 1,600 individuals, um, this is a graph turned on its side, uh, instead of the average proportion of African ancestry of 80%, it might bump up to 85%, which is what actually happens. And so we find this region in 1,600 men on chromosome eight, where we see a, about a million to 10 million to one odds of something so extreme. We map it to a region near a famous cancer proto-oncogene, and then we carried out a study in the following year where we find dissected the region and we found within it seven variants independently contributing risk for prostate cancer and that we know now know now know 
our long range enhancer affecting long range enhancer activity affecting this gene CMYK, um, that all are more common in frequency in Afri people of African than in European ancestry. And what's quite interesting uh, is that by themselves, these variants are enough to explain the increased risk for prostate cancer in African American men. One way to see this is that if you look in African American men who happen to have all European ancestry at this place in their genome, the risk for prostate cancer is the same as that for European American men. So while we were doing this work, uh, developing these tools for studying population mixture, which are of course uh, methodologically the same tools one wants to use to study history in a lot of ways, um, we were continuing this research program trying to study population mixture and leveraging the new genomic tools that were uh, becoming practical for medical genetics and were really not yet fully available uh, in the population genetics community, but we were sort of able to access them through uh, working on medical genetic projects, uh, studying, uh, uh, seeing what we could learn about human history. And a project that really occupied me for the first part of the 2000s was really studying what for me was a completely fascinating process, which really uh, I still find fascinating. And I think this story is still not fully told, which is the story of incomplete lineage sorting between uh, different closely related species that diverged at a close period of time. So uh, there's a, it's absolutely clear that while chimpanzees and bonobos are our closest uh, living relatives, um, and uh, that's very clear from multiple lines of evidence and very powerfully from genetic line, genetic evidence. In every place in the genome, that's not the case. So there are places, uh, and it won't be so much news to this audience, but there are places in the genome where instead of chimpanzees being our closest relatives, gorillas are. And there's places where humans are an outgroup to chimpanzees and gorillas. So it's only, I forget the exact number, but maybe about two thirds of the time when humans and chimpanzees are most closely related. And then the other, to one third approximately of the time, either humans and gorillas are most closely related or chimpanzees and gorillas are most closely related. That's because the three lineages diverged closely enough in time that not all the variants had swept to 100% frequency. Um, and sometimes they fix out in unusual ways. Um, and because of that, we, have, we can do population genetics with N equals three uh, on the population ancestral to humans and chimpanzees, which is super exciting because if you think about the period in time that can be interrogated by genetic data in humans, for example, uh, we can interrogate the last uh, million or maybe two million years uh, using ex extant variation, and then the record essentially goes dark because uh, we've all coalesced single ancestral lineage at that point. But then the record goes, lights up again uh, at five or six or seven million years ago, ancestral to the human chimpanzee population because of this incomplete lineage sorting. Um, and also because of just the two-way comparisons of humans and chimpanzees, but especially because of this incomplete lineage sorting. It's an amazing window into the past of an important period in our origins. And of course, this can be used in many other contexts as well, not just the human chimpanzee gorilla speciation process. So what we did in this work was we found a, the, the observation for us that was so exciting was that um, uh, when we do this analysis and try to make an inference about the ancestral population size of human and chimpanzees, what we infer is that it's very, very, very big, you know, order of magnitude larger than that of humans and five times larger than the most diverse chimpanzees today. Um, which was very surprising, and it's actually larger than any of the great ape populations. And not only that, when we apply the same analysis on the X chromosome, uh, we see infer a very much smaller population size, um, in fact, a typical population size. Uh, and, uh, and we hypothesize that what's going on is that uh, instead of there actually being a large population size, there's an initial speciation or population separation event, and then a very substantial separation, and then a coming together of those lineages, either in the ancestry of humans and chimpanzees before final separation. And because of this hybridization event, this creates a very diverse ancestral population uh, in the genetic data, but it's actually just lineages going down one of two or multiple routes. And that the groups, and we hypothesize that the groups were sufficiently divergent, that there were um, hybrid incompatibilities in operation, and it's known 
uh, in lots of diverse taxa that when hybrid incompatibilities are in operation, they often are especially effective on chromosome X. And so in this context, one might expect there to be very strong selective sweeps that specifically affect the X chromosome and cause it to fix out toward one or the other of the ancestral populations, causing more recent divergence between the two groups, producing exactly the type of pattern observed. Such patterns would be observed, for example, if one takes mice in the mouse uh, musculus domesticus, domesticus hybrid zone in Central Europe and then evolve them forward in time, you would see exactly this pattern. Now, since that time, there's been extensive evidence that, in fact, there was intense natural selection associated with the final separation of human and chimpanzees. And in fact, these patterns on the X chromosome are very, very non-randomly correlated to specific subcomponents of the X chromosome where sweeps are more or less intense. Um, and these same regions are actually correlated to uh, regions that are devoid of Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans, as well as regions that have also gone through X chromosome reductions in a number of grade eight taxa, consistent with the possibility that these are regions that in demographic, in the context of admixture or other demographic processes get turned on and become more intense regions of sweeps. I think this is an unfinished story and we certainly had not proved that observation, but I think the evidence that this is a hybridization event somehow has gotten even stronger. So I introduced that in part because I wanted to introduce how I got involved in ancient DNA analysis. So just a brief background on ancient DNA analysis. Um, I'm going to start the clock in talking about this in 2010 when it became possible for the first time and was for the first time whole genome data from humans uh, was generated. In the previous year, some mammoth DNA was generated, whole genome data. Um, and it starts with a human remain or a remain of an animal or a plant um, in a clean room where the goal is to protect the sample from the people handling it. We get beneath the surface of this remain. Uh, this is a petrous bone, which Ron Penhasi, uh, who's at the University of Vienna, uh, is really um, uh, been a critical person identifying this as a particularly rich source of DNA um, and is a very strong collaborator of mine. Um, and, uh, and so ancient DNA is often focused on this skeletal element. We try to get a particularly DNA rich part of this. Um, we obtain some powder, typically 40 milligrams. We dissolve the powder in a watery solution in an extraction mix that's optimized for these types of analyses uh, and uh, using a set of protocols that hopefully remove some of the inhibiting substances from soil and other, other uh, impurities that um, slow down the DNA or make the DNA uh, sequencing reactions ineffective and library preparation ineffective. And then we sequence. In our laboratory, we focused very intensively uh, on uh, in-solution enrichment, and I'll tell you about that briefly. So for me, a bit opportunity of a lifetime happened in 2007, and it really derives from that human chimpanzee speciation paper that I mentioned, where we were focusing on the question of trying to use genetic patterns to try to detect signals of mixture between populations, um, hybridization. Um, and Svante Pabo, at that time, it was very clear who, of course, as many of you will know, works in Leipzig and has run a laboratory focusing on um, human evolution and especially on uh, ancient DNA techniques, it became clear to him and his colleagues that they were going to be able to get whole genome data from uh, archaic humans, from Neanderthals. And um, Nick Patterson and I, when we were contacted by Svante, who was trying to put together a consortium to analyze the data from different aspects, including population genetics, for us, this was the opportunity of a lifetime, even though I was a faculty already and uh, he was a senior scientist, we just thought we we're gonna do anything we can to get involved with this amazing data. We thought this was the best data, the most interesting data we could imagine in the world. And so I sort of decided to sort of act like a postdoc again and really just spend a huge amount of my own research time uh, going back and forth between Leipzig, analyzing this data produced by Svante's group. And that, that was a seven year long research program. In 2010, um, we published uh, this paper, uh, which uh, documented a number of things about the Neanderthal genome, but I had an important role in the analysis that specifically tested the relationships between Neanderthals and modern humans, uh, because there was a question. Neanderthals were widespread archaic humans. They made sophisticated tools. They practiced intentional burial and were widespread from a few hundred thousand years ago until about 40,000 years ago in Western Eurasia, including Europe. And then modern humans expand dramatically into the region episodically 
uh, beginning at least 150,000 years ago, we now know, but uh, intensely after 50, 45,000 years ago, and within a few thousand years of encounter of this later wave of modern humans, Neanderthals are gone. Question had always been, had there been interbreeding between them, and had that interbreeding left a mark in the people uh, who live outside of Africa today, especially Europeans who are in the place where, your, where Neanderthals were most densely documented. Um, and so we discovered interbreeding, which was really a surprise for me because I was part of an intellectual tradition that had really found no evidence at all for interbreeding and had found again and again overwhelming evidence of this out of Africa origin of modern humans, which remains the case. But it looked like 100% to my colleagues and me. And so finding this evidence of interbreeding was something I was extremely skeptical about when I uh, had a, a chance to be part of this, this analysis. In the same year, essentially, uh, Svante's group working with um, uh, Anatoly Derevianko and Michael Shunkov and colleagues had the amazing luck and success and fortune of uh, being sent a pinky bone from Denisova Cave in South Central Siberia. And this would very well preserve DNA. They had gen generated whole genome data. So we were able to obtain data from this individual as well. And this individual is from another human population that simply had not been known about uh, before DNA data. So whereas the Neanderthals were, of course, well characterized based on archaeology, this was not even expected. And this is a sister cousin group of Neanderthals. It's not a very archaic descendant of Homo erectus. And we were also able to, in a huge surprise, able to show that these Denisovans interbred with modern humans too. And the it's even more in some human groups than in any group Neander groups that Neanderthals have contributed to. The highest proportions are in places like New Guinea, shown in a full dark circle here, and uh, where the proportion we estimated was now maybe three to five percent. And these pie charts show the estimated proportions in diverse populations in Eurasia and Africa. And we see that in East Asia, it's maybe a twentieth of the proportion that you see uh, in New Guinea and in Africa and Europe, very very little. Um, so uh, this is, was incredibly exciting. There were, there's a, been a, an amazing series of subsequent papers that some of which I was involved on. I'm not going to talk about that anymore here. Um, what I am going to talk about is the application of this incredible technology that Svante Pebo and colleagues, uh, but also many others, had a, a central role in uh, discovering uh, and making possible uh, to the Holocene and also uh, the ability for the first time to to look at human history on a genome-wide scale in this way. Um, so by 2009, um, advances in genomic technology, especially SNP arrays, which allowed one to interrogate hundreds of thousands of genetic variants simultaneously in a, in a DNA sample, made it possible to try to realize Luca cavalli sforzs vision, um, but with real statistical power to study frequency changes in many groups and individuals around the world. So in parallel to our work on Neanderthals, we were applying many of the same ideas and tests for mixture that we developed and deployed in the Neanderthal work. We developed and deployed them for studying relationships between modern populations. And this was a really central paper for us, um, our paper on reconstructing Indian population history, not with ancient data, but with modern data. Ancient data was not available yet. So we reached out to our Indian colleagues, K. Thangaraj and colleagues, uh, and we were really interested in studying people from the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal, that's in the bottom right of this plot. Um, but they convinced us also to study uh, diverse populations around India. So they, we collected together and assembled together from a collection they had in Hyderabad, uh, a group of 25 diverse populations from all around India, um, trying to represent a, a wide breadth of linguistic and, and, and uh, um, cultural diversity and, and supposed uh, genetic diversity. India is an extremely diverse place. And when we carried out analysis of the data, we saw a really amazing pattern uh, that was, uh, we worked very hard to try to unpack and to try to understand its origin. So here's the pattern. So what you see here on the bottom left are uh, two West Eurasian populations, uh, Europeans and, and uh, people of European origin. On the bottom right, you see East Asians as well as some groups from Northeast Asia that are East Asian-like genetically. Um, and then the ones at the top are all the South Asian groups. Uh, and this is a principal component analysis. So the way this is generated is the data is uh, about 600,000 rows corresponding to all the single nucleotide variants we're looking at, SNPs, um, and uh, the, uh, about uh, 150 or 200 columns corresponding to all the individuals that are being analyzed. 
um, the, the cells in the table are zero, one, or two, depending on whether you have zero, one, two copies of the alternate allele, for example, at a AC polymorphism, two Cs would be a two. And so you do principal components on this analysis to most efficiently uh, separate the samples from each other in, trying, in terms of linear combinations of the variants that explain the most uh, uh, um, uh, variation amongst the samples. The first principal component separates here Europeans and East Asians, and the second uh, South Asians from the others. But what we saw was a really amazing pattern, which was a line of increasing and decreasing amount of relatedness pointing right at like an arrow toward Europe and Western Eurasia. And so we wondered whether this might reflect mixture in India with people of West Eurasian related origin, and we deployed and developed a series of mathematical tests to test for this. Um, so uh, we were able to prove that this was in fact due to mixture, uh, and we thought it was a mixture of two source populations, one of which was related to West Eurasians and one of which was not closely related to West Eurasians at all. That turns out to be wrong. That's why that asterisk is there. In fact, those two source populations are themselves, especially the one that I thought was not closely related to West Eurasians, in fact, themselves had already a lot of West Eurasian admixture. And each of the two populations was themselves mixed of deeper populations, at least three within the last 5,000 years. So we know that now. So um, this brought us in the next couple of years uh, to 2011, and there was a faculty search at my institution. Um, in fact, at the department where I am now half appointed. Um, and uh, we were looking for a great geneticist to join this department. I was in another part of the university at the medical school, but we were looking for a great geneticist to join the department. And based on my experience working with Svante Pabo and all the amazing colleagues working on the Neanderthal project, I was absolutely convinced that it would be an incredible opportunity to bring DNA into our ancient DNA into our university. It was obvious that this technology, which was being applied by Svante Pabo and colleagues to archaic humans, was revolutionary also for studying how modern humans got to be the way they are today. And I was absolutely religiously convinced about how important this was. And so we had the most amazing set of applicants for our position. I'm not even going to tell you who they were, but it's like, you know, the Beatles. It's like the rocks. <laughs> These people are all. And they were all rejected by the department off the cuff uh, because they said this ancient DNA is not relevant to human evolution. And I just walked right out of that meeting and I just like I, I get angry maybe once every three or four years. And I said, this is I can't stand this. And I said, I'm going to just retool my own lab and do it myself. So that's what I did. So I shut down all my disease work, basically. You know, I finished the projects and I just asked my department, can I use a clean room in the department? Can I use a cold room in the department? Like it was basically like a closet. Can we turn it into a clean room? Our friends in Leipzig gave us, um, helped us to sort of uh, build clean rooms according to the specifications. We built a clean room. We actually even imported the kind of linoleum tile from Leipzig uh, just so that everything was the same, so that, so, so that it was the right sort of thing. And very luckily, um, Nadim Rowland, uh, who uh, did her training and graduate work in Leipzig, uh, had been working with me uh, as a technician and staff scientist for several years already. And so together, uh, we uh, built this laboratory with the help of our friends in Leipzig to study Holocene population history with ancient DNA. And um, so that was very exciting. Um, and uh, we've reached out to a few colleagues to try to see if we could identify sets of skeletal elements that would address some interesting questions about how people uh, got to be the way they are today, which is something that one could in principle do. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it was very, very clear that nobody would be recruited, so I built this uh, uh, lab with Nadine Rowland. So um, the idea I had is we also had very little money and no grants for this, and so the laboratories that were beginning to do this work were funded very well, like at the Max Planck Institute or their Center for Excellence and the University of Copenhagen with very large scale central fundings and enough money to do brute force shotgun sequencing of some of these ancient individuals. But we had no money um, and, uh, and uh, no grants to support this. Um, but I was from a genomics background in medical genetics. I was at the Broad Institute, which is one of the great genomes, is one of the great genome centers. And uh, we were very focused, we have this, from our medical genetics work, this very big focus on efficiency and scale and large numbers. 
And so it was very clear that some of the techniques being used in medical genetics, like exome capture and uh, in solution enrichment, would be quite powerful for, uh, for making possible this kind of analysis. This is not our idea to use in solution enrichment in humans, but we, uh, tool, we applied it in a particular context. So um, the reason this is so powerful is that when you get ancient DNA, most of the ancient DNA that we get is from individuals who have been colonized by other organisms after they die. So when you sequence a sample, most of the time, uh, it's not the case that 95% of the DNA you're getting is from a human or 99% as it is if you take a saliva or blood sample. Uh, instead, it's often 1% of the DNA. And if you're trying to learn about history, you just brute force sequence, even with the low cost of next generation sequencing, if only 1% of your sequences are human and the sequences you get anyway are short, often contaminated, uh, you basically run out of money uh, pretty quickly. And so what we decided to do is to use a trick for medical genetics, uh, which was in, enriched for parts of the genome that were informative about history and uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, and so instead of using exome enrichment, we created a new reagent that targeted uh, about 1.2 million positions in the genome. We did this collaborating with Matthias Meyer in Leipzig. So we ordered custom microarrays targeting 1.24 million SNPs uh, from uh, the company Agilent. Uh, and we published uh, this reagent, uh, which created a renewable resource that we could generate again and again for future experiments in this paper in 2015. So this was really quite transformative. Um, this has resulted in a cost reduction in quality improvement from enrichment. So there was a really important paper in 2015 uh, led by the group in Copenhagen, uh, S.K. Willersleds group, that was the first really big study scale applying ancient DNA uh, on, in the Holocene context. And it generated data from 101 individuals um, from about 5,000 to 3,000 years ago, mostly. Um, uh, obtained from screening a larger number of individuals. And each one of those individuals, they brute force sequence the DNA. And the x-axis is a log scale, and you should think about the uh, cost in euros or dollars as about that number on the x-axis. So typically they invested about 10,000 euros or dollars into each sample, uh, and they achieved an average coverage on the, uh, across the genome of maybe 0.2 fold. So with this technology, uh, we sequenced about 40 times less in, at the positions we analyzed and co-analyzed with modern humans for which we had SNP array data, uh, we had about four times higher coverage. So this was quite transformative. Um, and this technology, this in fact exact technology has been responsible for about 70% of the whole genome human DNA in the literature since that time. And we've uh, there's only been a few, uh, the groups that developed this reagent really have been the only ones who have been using it and it's been although it's fully public, it's economically challenging to resynthesize it. And so this has created kind of a dis discrepancy between a few groups that are using this and other groups that are using shotgun approaches or not able to use this reagent. But we've worked with two companies, uh, Twist and Arbor, to make equivalent enrichment reagents available. And they're now accessible to everyone. And the Twist one in particular is better. Um, and uh, we've, we've now switched to it and for our data going forward. Um, so as a result of a whole series of innovations, not just by our group, but by the field in general, there's been an explosion in the amount of ancient DNA work from the first data published in 2010 to a tenfold increase in the number of whole genome sequence, whole genome data sets in 2014 uh, to another tenfold jump by 2016 to uh, more than 5,000 individuals today. Uh, in our laboratory, we have an additional 10,000 individuals with whole genome data that are not even yet published, but that we're working toward bringing to publication. I assume that's also the case with many of the other wonderful laboratories that are working in this field. So when it, you have such a rapid growth of data, it becomes possible to ask and answer questions that simply weren't possible to ask before. Um, and um, that's one of the really exciting uh, things that we can do. And it's, you know, with other exponential technologies, every increase by order of magnitude makes it possible to answer new questions. And there's been so little time that we haven't even asked all the questions we could have asked already three years ago. So it's a very exciting time in this field. I'll try to give you a little taste of that. Um, we've also been working on generating public atlases of modern and ancient diversity. For example, this project of 300 genomes from diverse project populations that we made fully available pre-publication. 
uh, also this data from uh, more than a thousand populations with a more than 8,000 of them now fully published um, and downloadable data uh, that is a compendium of uh, all the world's ancient DNA data, not just from our group, but from the many other groups, as well as whole genome sequences that like the modern diversity project we've been releasing pre-publication um, already more than 200 of them. So now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some of the findings of this field um, and in particular talk about uh, how it's been so surprising. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the archaic human work uh, here, but I'm going to talk about Holocene population history. And one thing that we've learned again and again is that we have a profoundly wrong understanding of many aspects of the past. So I'm going to tell you first about the problem of Indo-European origins. So I think uh, we all speak Indo-European languages, I think, on this, if you're listening to English and if you're a German speaker, uh, you speak an Indo-European language. And it was noticed uh, more than 200 years ago uh, by multiple people, but including uh, William Jones, who was a British colonialist uh, um, administrator and judge in Calcutta in India. And he had learned Latin and Greek in his schoolboy days. Um, and uh, he also became interested in uh, the liturgical language in Northern India, Sanskrit. And when he studied it, he learned, he realized that it was actually very similar in many aspects to Latin and Greek. He wrote, the Sanskrit language, whatever may be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of the verbs and forms of grammar than could possibly have been produced by accident, so strong indeed that no philologer, that's a linguist, could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. After that, a major question in scholarship was, uh, why is it that these languages spoken in Europe with very few exceptions like Hungarian or Estonian Finnish or Basque, and in India, Northern India, also in Iran and Armenia, why are they so similar and what, where could they have sprung from? <clears throat> so Colin Renfrew in 1987 put forward a really exciting hypothesis that became the dominant hypothesis until just a few years ago um, for how Indo-European languages spread. And the idea is that they spread through the origin of farming. So after uh, uh, it became uh, after radiocarbon revolution and we learned the chronology of the spread of farming and where farming arose first, we now know farming developed for the first time in the Near East. 12 to 11,000 years ago, and then it exploded into Europe after 8,500 years ago, and over the next couple of thousand years moved to all the far corners of Europe. It also exploded in other directions into Iran and into eventually into South Asia and independent farming revolutions affected other parts of the world. So he argued that this economic transformation was so massive and also linguistic studies shows that languages typically spread through mo movements of people that the only way you could get very large numbers of people moving was in the context of an economic transformation of this. And so maybe the spread of farmers from the Near East, from Anatolia, brought these languages into Europe and spread of other farmers brought them, uh, again, from the Anatolian or Caucasus region, brought them eventually into Iran and India. Maybe that's what happened. But this alternative idea, uh, which is uh, had, was actually predated and is from Maria Gimbutas, a Lithuanian American, archaeologist argued that these languages come from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea uh, a little bit later and are not spread through farming. Um, and uh, this has been, this theory has been looked at in many ways and the most uh, sort of a, a recent very powerful articulation of it was by David Anthony in a book in 2007 called Horse Wheel and Language. Um, and one really amazing piece of evidence is this that uh, almost all these languages, except for the earliest splitting ones, Anatolian languages like Hittite, uh, have common shared uh, words when reconstructed that uh, are for wheels and horses and carts, including in India and Iran and, and in ancient Chinese uh, langu uh, uh, languages from Western China that are also Indo-European, as well as in the European Indo-European languages. And we know when the wheel was invented from archeology, span it was uh, invented no earlier than five and a half thousand years ago. And because of this, the argument is that this must have spread from a common source after that time. Um, so now I'm going to tell you what the ancient DNA data brings to this question. So uh, in 2014 and 15 and then 16, uh, we and others obtained data for the first time 
uh, from uh, ancient farmers, not just of Europe, but of the Near East. So in our 2016 paper, uh, we got data for the first time from Iranian farmers and Levantine farmers, and we compared them to European hunter-gatherers. And we found that each of these four groups, when measured based on squared allele frequency differentiation, FST, was as different from each other approximately as Europeans and East Asians are today. So that's amazing. So if you go back 8,000 years to Europe and you carry out a categorization of the people, you see that there's as much differentiation within this region of the Western Eurasia, where today people are genetically relatively similar, often called, called quote, Caucasians or whites or something like this. In fact, just as recently as 8,000 years ago, we're as different as Europeans and East Asians, and the fault lines between groups would have been drawn differently if you could do so at the time. So in this bar plot that I show you at the left, these colors represent ancestry from these three highly differentiated sources. And it's not as if none of them disappear to produce the relative homogeneity today. They just mix with each other over the next 4,000 years until by 4,000 years ago, the um, early to middle Bronze Age, there was the low level of differentiation we see today. Okay, so now let's focus on Europe uh, where you are all sitting. Um, so before 5,000 years ago, uh, we knew already in 2014 and 15 that Europeans were a mixture of two ancestries. And we had data from a number of individuals, they're shown in this bar plot here, that are a mixture of farmers and foragers, hunter-gatherers, farmers who came from the Near East, from Anatolia, about 80% of the ancestry, but variable in different parts of Europe, and foragers, hunter-gatherers, who are the indigenous local hunter-gatherer hunter population, population of Europe with different types of foragers in different parts of the European continent or subcontinent. But if you look at the same type of analysis today, bing, there's a new ancestry that's not there four or 5,000 years ago, uh, this red ancestry. So we knew already in 2014, something had arrived later after 5,000 years ago, when did it arrive? So we had a clue about this from something that we discovered and published on in 2012, the following. So in 2012, we developed a statistical test. Actually, it was in 2009, we applied it in our India paper, but we sort of formalized it in 2012 and applied it in this context that we call the three population test. So in this cartoon, um, these are like cartoons of DNA strands, and they're supposed to be the frequency in three different populations of uh, a particular variant, like a cytosine thymine polymorphism. And we're looking at the frequency of the variant, and we're trying to see its frequency in three different populations. And so here, the variant is pretty high frequency in Native Americans, intermediate in frequency in Northern Europeans, and low frequency in Sardinians. And so one way this could occur is if the Northern Europeans were a mixture of Native Americans, or at least people ancestral to Native Americans, and people like Sardinians. But of course, this is only one location. So if you average this over hundreds of thousands of locations, you can also make this assessment. And if they are intermediate, this proves that the population that's intermediate is mixed of two groups differentially related to Native American Sardinians. So we took data from the Human Genome Diversity Project from SNPRA data. So it's about 50 groups from around the world. And we took each of those 50 groups or so as a target population. And then we took each of the other two groups as a source and for each target, we trusted all possible pairs of four sources and looked for the strongest signal of mixture we could find. And for Northern Europeans, we found this amazing 17 sigma negative signal that said that Northern Europeans are mixed and that the two groups that maximized the signal were definitely Native Americans, not any other group, and Sardinians. And of course, we did not think that your Native Americans had migrated across the Atlantic to uh, uh, Europe. Uh, we thought that was unlikely for a variety of reasons. Instead, we hypothesized that there was a population we now call a ghost population, a population that existed in the past, but doesn't exist anymore in unmixed form, but we can reconstruct statistically based on the patterns of variation we see today. So we call these the ancient North Eurasians who would have lived in Northern Eurasia and contributed some ancestry to people in the Americas and descendants of them too would have contributed to Europeans. So we made this prediction, and then at the end of 2013, uh, the uh, S.K. Willerslev's group uh, uh, um, working in Copenhagen obtained DNA from an individual who lived 24,000 years ago at the, by the shores of Lake Baikal in Siberia. And this individual uh, in this heat map was related both to Native Americans and to Europeans. Um, and the reason is that, is that they are the ancient North Eurasians. They give an even stronger signal. So you can predict these ghosts and then find them in ancient DNA. 
So here's what happens. So here's a principal component analysis con constructed just like the ones on Indian populations I mentioned to you before. Um, I'm not showing the axis here, but here the data is about 600,000 positions and about 1,000 people. And each dot is a person from the locations in Western Eurasia shown here. And when you carry out this analysis, you get two, uh, on the x-axis and y-axis, you get two parallel gradients with relatively few people in between. On the left uh, is Europeans, on the right uh, is Near Easterners, and at the bottom is the Mediterranean, and at the top is the non-Mediterranean population. So this is an amazing picture. Now I'm gonna gray out the dots, and I'm gonna show you where ancient Europeans fall on this uh, relative to modern ones. So the hunter-gatherers of Europe fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. And so the correct interpretation of this, you can formally show, not through this analysis, but through other analyses, is that Europeans today are a mixture of people like these, a ghost population that no longer exists in unmixed form, and people like this, Near Easterners. The first farmers of Europe uh, are uh, pile up on top of present-day Sardinia, reflecting the fact that Sardinians today uh, have a relatively high proportion of ancestry from people like them. And then meanwhile, in the far east of uh, Europe, in uh, the steppes north of the Black and Caspian Sea, uh, Yamnaya steppe pastoralists uh, arise, and you still don't see this main gradient of variation that you see in northern and central and southern Europe. And only after 5,000 years, boom, you see it. So something happens between 5,000 and 4,500 years ago. So summary is that Europe was massively transformed by two major migrations. First, bringing farmers into Europe after 8,500 years ago, replacing about 80% to 100% of the ancestry, depending on the population, a massive event, resulting in these bar plots of mixed individuals. And then this later and previously completely unanticipated event, where steppe pastoralists, people related to the Yamnaya, move into Europe, displace 70% of the population in places like Germany and Austria, uh, and uh, also contribute heavily to almost everyone eventually in Europe, and in fact are the primary source population in much of Northern Europe today. So who are these Yamnaya people? Well, this is a skeleton from one of the people we studied from the Samara Valley in Russia. They were uh, very tall. Uh, the, they um, uh, were the, probably the first people who took uh, carts and horses, domesticated horses out into the open steppes. Um, and they were able to exploit the vast resources of the steppes in ways that had not been done before by taking advantage of these new inventions. And they expanded all the way to Mongolia uh, in the east and to Hungary in the west. Uh, and clearly their ancestry spread into Europe very dramatically as part of this process. So uh, a question had always been whether it was the Yamnaya themselves uh, or uh, whether it's uh, people related to the Yamnaya. And this has been a puzzling open question. It reminds me a little bit about the question about whether it's the Neanderthals admixing into modern humans or some population related to the Neanderthals that was eventually resolved. We've resolved this now, we think, in a similar way. And this is work led by Harold Ringbauer, who is Austrian and I think may have been worked with a number of you uh, when he was a grad student. Um, so we now have sampled Yamnaya genomes and they're tied within generations through identity by descent segments to people who spread Yamnaya and, and this ancestry further west in the guise of cultures like the Cordedware culture. So here's the type of analysis we're doing. So if you take data from uh, lots of different groups uh, from which we have data, so like Yamnaya groups, uh, these Cordedware groups, early European farmers, and you compare them to each other and see how many of pairs, comparisons, share segments identical by descent uh, with uh, that are sizes uh, 8 to 12 centimorgans in size, pretty, pretty big chunks. What you see is there's tons of sharing amongst the Yamnaya because they're a geographically highly dispersed and broadly tightly related population. And there's also sharing with these cordedware individuals. Uh, and that's because the Yamnaya are in fact tied within generations to the cordedware individuals. You also see connections to a specific European farmer cultures of the corded ware, the globular amphora, and we're able to identify which specific European farmer cultures, the Yamnaya or their very close relatives, interacted with. So what happened next? So this is how steppe ancestry spreads west. So uh, this is work led by Nigo Alalde. Um, and if you look at what happens in Britain, uh, farming gets to Britain for the first time much later than it does to southeastern Europe. It gets there 6,000 years ago with a 99% replacement of the local hunter-gatherers. 
By 4,500 years ago, the last big stones at this famous monument of Stonehenge go up and steppe ancestry is still not there and then bang, it arrives. And it's a basically a 90% minimum population replacement and it's permanent. For the first time you see ancestry similar to what you see in Britain today. And the people who built Stonehenge are largely not ancestral to people who live in Britain today. Here's what happens in Iberia in Spain and Portugal. Same time period, 6,000 to 4,500 years ago, no steppe ancestry, bang, it arrives. Uh, here there is clear evidence of both groups living together, but after 4,000 years ago, these groups collapse and admix with each other. And here it's only a 40% population replacement, but you'll notice something in the coloring of the dots, which corresponds to the sexes of the individuals. And, um, and what you see here is that the dots uh, the, are either empty, which are the females who, who use can't assign the Y chromosome to, or they're colored. And the coloring is bluish if it's a, a Y chromosome that's characteristic of the farmers who lived uh, in uh, Iberia prior to, uh, and Europe in general, prior to the arrival full of steppe pastoralists. And it's red if it's a steppe Y chromosome that hadn't been there prior to this. And what you see is there's a nearly 100% replacement of the Y chromosomes. So that tells you that the Y chromosomes were uh, replaced uh, almost completely despite only 40% whole genome replacement. Um, and what that means is that the males coming in uh, outcompeted or had preferential access to local females uh, in a context of extreme social inequality. I've been talking actually slower than I expected, and I wanted to just take a check from the people who are organizing this talk to ask me, ask what you would like me to do. I have additional material that I could present, but I'm also, but too much to present in the time we have allotted. So I could open up the floor to questions now, um, or I could just briefly talk about demographic history, uh, anything you want. Uh, you have as much time as you want. Okay. So you, it's perfectly fine if you go on and uh, talk about demographic history. Okay, so I'm going to skip some things and continue with others. So this is, I'm not going to talk about the step spread to India, which is very interesting. And the formation of this gradient I talked to you about before. And I am going to mention that it's very clear now that, in my opinion, that step ancestry tracks the spread of Indo-European languages. And it's very likely that Yamnaya step pastoralists spread late Proto-Indo-European languages, that is the languages ancestral to all Indo-European languages that are spoken, uh, but maybe not to Hittite. Um, and that this also occurred in India with the steppe ancestry and probably Indo-European languages being pulsed into India between about 4,000 to 3,500 years ago and being overrepresented in people of traditionally priestly social status who are custodians of the Indo-European texts. Um, so I'm gonna skip the section on the Southwest Pacific uh, about uh, po possibly even more dramatic linguistic, certainly more dramatic linguistic expansion than even Indo-European across the Pacific, which is within a few thousand years. Um, and uh, evidence of massive uh, initial migration and, um, and population uh, replacement uh, in uh, multiple islands, including Vanuatu, extreme sex bias gene flow, similar to what you see in Iberia, as well as back migrations. I'm gonna skip this evidence, but I'm gonna conclude by talking about something I'm particularly excited about, which is learning about population history and demographic history from ancient DNA data. So you probably, many of you know that there are these personal ancestry testing companies that have databases now of 10 million people, some of them like 23andMe or Ancestry.com and other companies. Um, and what they do is they look for individuals who are closely related to each other. So they find segments of DNA where there are very few differences between one of the two chromosomes people carry, two people carry, and you can find long lost second cousins or third cousins or fourth cousins this way. You should be able to do this also to ancient people, but a problem is, is that, of course, we don't have 10 million ancient people in the database, so maybe it's going to be impossible. Maybe we simply don't have enough comparisons to do it. But it turns out that population sizes are small enough in the past that with the type of sample sizes we're getting, thousands of people in some ancient cultures, we're seeing many, many connections between people. 
And so it's like an amazing gift to be able to see this. So this is an application of this technology to early European farmers. And you could see the two networks of early European farmers, the, the, the Mediterranean route of expansion and the Danubian route of, expan uh, of expansion with relatively few connections between them. So um, now I'm gonna tell you briefly about what we can do with 800 genomes from a single place as densities get larger. So we have data from Britain. So I already told you about this a little bit. Um, so early hunter gatherers in Europe, uh, you can predict their phenotypes. They would have been very, very dark skinned, almost like many people in Africa, probably blue eyes um, until just before 6,000 years ago. And then bang, that's this uh, uh, step arrival. And then here's blowing in, blowing that up period up. Here's the hunter gatherer period, step arrival. And then we see lots of variation in terms of outliers coming in probably from the continent. And then we now have evidence of later movements into Britain from the continent with the proportion of farmer ancestry rising back as there's a new migration in between about 3,400 and 3,000 years ago. So you can see ever more subtle patterns. Um, but uh, with this very large data set, you can also make inferences about population size. So I'm gonna tell you about not my work, but work that's been done by a number of people, including for example, Sharon and Brian Browning, which are uh, ideas for estimating population size uh, from segments of, of shared ancestry. So if you are in a very big population like Han Chinese, the probability that two random people are related within say the sixth degree, if you take a random person in Shanghai and a random person in Beijing is extremely small because it's a billion people or more. But if you take two people uh, living on a little Andaman Island in the Bay of Bengal, and you ask if are they likely related within the sixth degree if they're from the indigenous group there, it's probably quite high. And that's because the gene pool that's being drawn from is much smaller. And therefore the inverse of the rate of relatedness of two random people within close time is related to population size. So multiple people have tried to take advantage of this idea to estimate population sizes trajectories over time, including the Brownings. And uh, they developed this method that they applied. And in the UK, they can reconstruct population size trajectory over time and infer that with a sufficiently large sample size that the population size has been order of tens of millions of people in recent generations, which is accurate. Um, there's, you have to realize, and everybody here probably will know this, that census size is not the same as the genetically inferred size. The genetically inferred size, the uh, effective population size refers to the um, number of reproducing individuals effectively at any one time, which won't count the very young children or the old people who are part of the population and won't count people who are not as effectively reproducing and will also uh, not take into account the subtleties and differences between male and female reproductive success and rates and variability. The ratios of these two numbers are typically estimated to between three to tenfold uh, in terms of effective size being that much smaller than true census size. So this is also done in another uh, by Pierre Palomara and colleagues looking at the Ashkenazi Jewish populations who used it to reconstruct a history for the population of an initial expansion, maybe 6,000 years ago, uh, to a larger size, maybe a thousand years ago, a crash uh, with a relatively small number of founders and then a re-expansion to a large size today. So it's exciting how you can do this. So in a paper that we published just at the end of 2020, we applied some ideas and there were many things in this paper, but we applied this to people of the pre-contact Caribbean. So in this paper, we combined our data with data that was produced by another group that year uh, to obtained data from 263 individuals from the pre-contact Caribbean going all the way up to 1492. And uh, uh, what we were able to do is look at how closely related, first of all, people's two chromosomes at each chromosome were related to each other. So two copies of your own chromosome three, how closely are they related to each other? Well, one of them is from one of your parents, one of them is from your other parent. Um, and therefore they show how closely related your two parents are, the rate of close kin unions. And what we found is that these people in the pre-contact Caribbean really avoided close kin unions. They try not to have uh, children with people who are their siblings or aunts or nieces, uh, or even their cousins or even second cousins. They try to avoid that as much as possible. Nevertheless, the, and the reason we can see that is we don't see that, that many very, very large here red segments of DNA of shared identical by descent um, 
creating runs of homozygosity in a particular genome. However, um, nevertheless, there's lots of smaller segments, and that's because just it's impossible in a small population to avoid uh, having children with someone relatively closely related to you. So based on the rate of this background uh, runs of homozygosity, we can estimate the population size and work led by Harold Ringbauer. And we get these really quite tiny estimates in the Caribbean of about 3,000, of, of order of 1,000 to 2,000 in these uh, later groups in the Caribbean, many, many different sites we analyzed. We were worried that maybe what we were seeing was just isolation of these individual sites. And maybe if you took the population of, say, Hispaniola as a whole, the total population size would be inferred to be bigger. So what we did is we looked across individuals. We did what 23andMe does did, and we looked for cousins. We looked across individuals, and we looked for the rate of sharing. And what we found was, uh, so just to tell you, so when you compare across individuals, you don't have to just compare the two chromosomes within an individual. Uh, if you have one individual, you 10 individuals, you compare, compare all 10 individuals to each other. So that's 10 choose two pairs. Actually, it's 20 choose two pairs. So it's about 200 comparisons. With 100, it's, it's, it's uh, about 20,000 comparisons. So it increases quadratically the power of this analysis along with sample size. So we did this initially on the X chromosome in males because it was technically easier there. And when we do this analysis across Hispaniola or comparing Hispaniola and the neighboring island of Puerto Rico, we infer sizes on the order of, uh, instead of around 800 to 2,000 on a per site basis, we infer sizes of um, about 3,000. So we also detect 19 pairs of cousins across islands, like the Bahamas and Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. So what's very clear is that the Caribbean is a very small place drawing from a very small gene pool. As I mentioned, census size is three to 10 times effective population size. When Christopher Columbus uh, uh, returned from the Americas for the first time after 1492, he and his consortium reported to the Spanish crown that the population size of Hispaniola was more than a million people. Subsequent colonists estimated three to four million people. Um, and, uh, but, and the estimates, even until very recent times, are going up to eight million and almost all of them uh, hundreds of thousands of people. But the genetic data say that the set effective size is order of uh, 3,000 people and no more than 8,000 people in the confidence interval. And so even accounting for the fact that census size can be three to 10 times larger than effective size, there were likely no more than some tens of thousands of people uh, in the pre-contact Caribbean, which is a huge discrepancy from the historical records. And is another example of the surprises that DNA can yield. Demography, our picture of past demography is obviously deeply wrong, at least in the Americas, and I would not be surprised if it's wrong in many, many places in the world. And it's really exciting to try to apply this tool where we can now look at it directly to look at demography. And remember when I was a kid, we had this book at home called The Atlas of World Population History, and I used to endlessly pore over it, trying to learn, look, and they had pictures of how populations grew in different places. But I now think that book is completely unreliable in many parts of the world. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to find linkages in this way in many other parts of the world. And finally, thanks. Um, if you're looking for a postdoc and think that are interested in this area, please contact me or one of the many other amazing people working in this field. Um, and uh, hope, um, I guess I have some time for questions now.